interesting about that is this is the deepest freshwater lake in North America. It is pretty clear. I mean, you can see along several hundred feet uh, down into this thing. The water there is all snow melt runoff. So it's very, very pure water, very clear. Okay. All right, so basically, just to give you a quick introduction, this is kind of the things that we're going to see. So we're going to divide the different landforms into these four categories. Uh, constructive, which simply means that it's positive in the sense that the landform is being built above the land surface. We'll talk about destructive landforms, which means they're depressed below the land surface. Uh, Subaqueous obviously means they were formed underwater. And then subglacial. So there's a few uh, landforms that are uh, basically unique to that sort of category. Uh, most of which we find those obviously in the northern latitudes. Uh, a lot of the names for those actually came from Iceland and was of course kind of recognized. Because okay. Iceland obviously is volcanically very active and there are glaciers there. So lots of volcanoes erupt under glaciers. Okay. So constructed landforms, some, I guess a lot of these you've seen already in physical geology, but we're going to go into a bit more detail about these. Volcanic plateaus, which we covered a little bit last time. We were talking about continental flood basalts and things like that. Um, there's also rhyolite uh, plateaus, although they're not anywhere near as common. Okay, lava flow structures. We'll talk about a few of those, but I'm going to save the actual discussion of these lava flows until we get actually, we'll have a, we'll have a lecture on lava flow. Why does it flow? Uh, how does it build these structures and that sort of stuff, sort of the characteristics of the lava. Okay, domes, uh, necks, cinder cones, shield volcanoes, and then finally, uh, we'll it. And I'm sure a lot of these you guys have talked about, obviously, in your physical geology classes, so we'll uh, cover a little bit more detail there. Okay, so let's start with the basaltic plateaus. Again, these are like the ones we talked about the last time, characterized by these uh, flood basalts, or these very large continental flood basalts. Uh, again, as I mentioned, most of the time people believe that these represent the emergence of a mantle plume. So the plume itself basically has the ability to create a huge mass of eruptive material over a relative short periods of time, like you know, thousands of years. Okay. So again, these are erupting from a rift fissure or series of linear events. And the reason most people think that it's a rift fissure is simply because when that plume head comes to the surface, it's elevating the surface to putting the surface in tension as it pulls up. It's like, it's like ballooning up, if you will, as the plume rises. So it puts the surface in tension, and you end up with a series of fissures or cracks through which the, then the magma from the plume head can then erupt. Okay, so again, lots of individual flows over a relatively short period of time. And some of these flows can be greater than 100 meters or 300 and some odd feet in thickness. And these are, this is a great example here. Here's the Columbia River flood basalt. Did anybody ever been up there in uh, sort of Oregon, southern Washington, northern Oregon? Um, and you see here, basically, this is a whole series of individual lava flows that were basically covering the land here. And commonly what happens is it basically creates this flat plateau on top. Okay, that's why it's called a, a basaltic plateau. Okay. Again, a whole series of hoey hoey and occasionally ah uh, lava sh uh, sheet flows. Um, again, this is kind of an interesting phenomenon. You can see some of that, at least in the Columbia River basalts. When it comes in contact with water, it creates this material called haloclastite. Can anybody guess what that means? Remember from petrology, what does halo indicate? It's glass, right? Mm -hmm. So clastite means basically fragments, so it's basically fragmented basaltic glass. <coughs> Okay. So you'll see that buried in the, sometimes in the bottoms of these lava flows, which indicated that it probably flew, flow over some type of water, either some type of standing freshwater lake or a river or stream. Okay. Um, so those are common on the bottom of these flows. Okay. Now we talked about here last time, this is a Norwegian word called traps. And traps simply just means stairs or stair stepped. Okay. And it basically these appear like that simply from erosion. Okay, so what it's representing is the differential erosion of each one of these hundreds and hundreds of individual lava flows. As you can kind of see here in the Siberian traps, uh, here's one in uh, Ethiopia, although it's not entirely clear. You can kind of see it fuzzy here and there. Okay, so again, as I mentioned, they commonly have a very flat top, just like the mares on the moon. Okay, now why do you think it has a flat top? 
Think about the type of lava that's being eroded here. Yeah, it's very low in viscosity. The salt's very low in viscosity. So it flows very readily. So we start to erupt these things, they're just gonna flow out, basically forming these very flat sheets. Okay, so you get these very, very flat plateau tops on them. Okay, um, and again, sometimes people will have basically uh, either spatter cones or center cones, uh, sometimes shield, really small shield volcanoes uh, dotted along the surface, indicating that some of the vents that will be erupting. Okay, now as I mentioned, you do get right on occasion rhyolitic plateaus. Um, and again, sometimes these have been misclassified um, as lava flows, as I mentioned from the uh, Davis Mountains in West Texas. Okay, but most of the time these are being formed by plantian eruptions with these very, very large, actually sometimes super plantian, super eruptions, very, very large pyroclastic density flows and ash ball deposits. Okay, so this material is explosively ejected in the air in mass quantities, forming those eruptive columns. Those eruptive columns then become unstable and collapse, and you get these massive power density currents that basically create a very large area that ultimately the material settles out, okay, and forms a plateau. Okay, these are called a and Okay, um, and again, the, like I mentioned, sometimes these are these were classified as rhyolitic flows, but they weren't really. So essentially what can happen if that stuff falls out and still relatively hot, it's gonna weld its stuff together. So this is like a welded tuff, very hard, very indurated, and it looks just like a lava flow, okay? But in reality, it's not. Okay, now, sometimes these will be associated with a caldera formation. So essentially in a caldera, you're actually ejecting the vast majority of the magma chamber. So what happens after the magma chamber has been ejected? collapses in yeah, on itself? You, that's right, you get a collapse of the basically the surface to form a caldera. And sometimes when you do that, you're gonna push some of this material out through the remaining fractures around the caldera, out and forming these elevated plateaus just around the caldera itself. These are sometimes referred to as tablelands, okay? Uh, the great, best example of that is in the uh, Bishop Tuck in Long Valley, California. Okay, in the Long Valley Caldera. When that thing erupted, basically formed the caldera and collapsed. It pushed out at least toward the south, toward the little town of Bishop. Is that here in Memphis? Bishop, California, Eastern California. There's this massive table land, if you will, of, of rhyolite. Okay, and you start at Bishop, you're about 4,000 feet above sea level, and within a distance of, of probably less than 10 miles, you're at the top of the table lands, and you've risen about 3,000 feet. Okay, going from top to bottom. So, very, very uh, large uh, table land. That way. Okay, now lava flow structures. Um, again, one of the things that's recognized those is those have to, have to remember that lava, and we'll cover that when we get into the properties of the different uh, magmas. Lavas are not like water, which has essentially no strength. Lavas have lots of strength. Okay, even the low viscosity basaltic ones have a certain amount of strength to them, a certain amount of shear strength or shear resistance to them. And when they flow, they will actually create levees, okay? Okay, so again, the levees are being created the outside as the magma cools. It has a certain amount of shear strength to it, so that material then tends to resist flow more on the outside as it continues to cool, and it creates natural levees, just like in a river channel, okay? And then the remaining lava will flow in the center of that, okay? Um, so if you have a nice example here from Hawaii, notice in this case, um, so in some cases, the lava is actually overflowing this right here. Okay, we also get these things called step toes or tagalas. Okay, and essentially what that is is just some pre existing structure that was higher than the final lava flows. Okay, so it looks like this little isolated island of rock of a different composition is sitting out in the middle of the lava flow. But in reality, it was, it was pre existing, it was already there, and then the lava flow, when it flowed and formed the plateau, it just kind of enclosed it, okay? Uh, you see, also see lots of these out, out west in the uh, place in the range. Okay. All right, we talked about this one already, lava tubes and tunnels. Remember, the, especially the basaltic lavas, quite often, sometimes in the lava flows, um, the top of it will cool, forming this sort of uh, glassy, very well insulating top cover. 
and the remaining magma inside, simply because it's insulated, will remain hot uh, and easily flow. So basically, as the volcano continues to erupt, it's flowing in these sort of subterranean channels for that reason. Okay, so it's not cooling, it's not crystallizing, simply because it's insulated by a cover that was basically uh, from some previous eruption that crystallized. Okay, now what can happen sometimes, obviously, is when the eruption ceases or we stop producing magma from the vent, that remaining magma in that tunnel eventually will just drain out, leaving behind basically a hollow tunnel. Okay, called a lava tube or sometimes a lava tunnel. Okay, and I think I showed you some great pictures of that from Northern California. Okay, again, very, very rare, but you do see occasionally you will see myolytic lava flows. Uh, again, sometimes these have been confused with ignimbrites, but they do exist, okay? The problem with these, the reason these are so rare is because most of these bryolytic eruptions are going to explode and not flow, okay? Um, but they're sometimes found in association with the caldera that I talked about that. Quite often, basically, once the caldera floor collapses, sometimes whatever remaining magma is in the, uh, in the magma chamber essentially gets pushed out um, toward the sides of the caldera through whatever fracture system it can find. And those will sometimes result in these right away lava flows. Okay, here's a good example from uh, southwestern Idaho. Okay, so again, they will form these sort of dome-like extrusions. Okay. Uh, these are, again, these extrusions, don't like extrusions, are similar to the day sitting lava dome, which we'll talk about here in a second, but they have a much higher yield strength than, than the Stasi, obviously. Okay. Okay, again, I just want to point out that these exist, but they're extremely rare. Okay. All right, now, I've got a great example here, too. Sometimes you will see in these rhyolitic lava flows, you'll also see what's called obsidian flows. So the obsidian basically is a rhyolitic magma that essentially has been mostly degassed. There's no, not a lot of volatiles in it. The difference in the typical rhyolitic explosion is it's got a lot of volatiles in it. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why it explodes when it reaches the surface, because all those volatile bubbles in there are trying to expand. They're under really high pressure because of the viscosity of the magma. They can't escape very easily. So when they get to the surface, they expand very rapidly and explode. Okay, now occasionally you will get basically the rhyolitic magma coming to the surface and it's been somewhat degassed or largely degassed. Okay, um, but there still is some, some gas in there, but, it, but not enough to make it explode. So it ends up on the surface as it flows sometimes with obsidian. Obviously the mycidian material that you can see in this one that's black, okay, is rapidly cooled. Remember that's how obsidian forms, it cools very, very rapidly. Now, it's still really warm, it's still relatively ductile, in other words it can still flow under the influence of gravity, okay, and as it flows, the flow sometimes will allow the, whatever remaining gas is in there to start to dissolve out. And then what happens is, is those remaining gases form in these materials here in sort of a frothy pump, which we call pumps. So essentially what this is, is basically just a mixture of obsidian and pumice that was formed as the obsidian started to flow and it start to continue to dissolve whatever little bit of gas was still left in. Okay? And this one is from, also from Long Valley, California, from a place called Glass Mountain, surprisingly. <laughs> okay. All right, now, you will also get it for me on these things called pressure ridges. Remember we talked about last time in the Hoi, Hoi flows, you see these pressure ridges. What causes those? Cooling on the top the Okay, so essentially as the flow moves out, of course it's cooling, and the flow front out here, basically it's still very ductile, so it's still flowing, but as it more cools, it starts to slow down, and the, the warmer stuff behind it starts to pile up. So you end up with these series of ridges called pressure ridges. The same thing can happen here. And I'm going to show you another example here when we get to the, talk about domes. Um, that can be shown to extreme when we get into things like coolies. Okay. okay, any questions about that? City of flows. Okay, now, volcanic domes, most of these are going to be acidic in composition. 
Um, and I, as we mentioned previously, sometimes these can be very, very dangerous, uh, especially the plamian type. Uh, okay, these are the ones that create the collapse and the newi ardentes or the pyroclastic surges. Okay, but what I'm showing here list is different classes of domes uh, from most viscous to least viscous as we move down the chart here. So these are upheaval plugs, sometimes called cryptodomes. So this is just like taking a tube of toothpaste and squeezing it and watching the toothpaste come out the top. Okay, generally speaking, this, this the acidic lava in this case is has a lower volatile content typically. So it stays inherently intact. Okay, as it, it as it moves up, and also because it has a much much higher viscosity, okay, that allows it to kind of move up just like a piston. Okay, now helium domes basically it has to be very steep sides like this with jagged aprons. These are the ones. Obviously, it gets the name helium from uh, Mount Pierre. Remember where was Mount Pierre? I'm sorry. It was, uh, yeah, that was in Martinique. Remember, it completely destroyed uh, Saint Pierre the city. Uh, surge. So these basically are, are a little bit much higher volume content, a little bit lower viscosity, but these can collapse sometimes. Okay, low domes called tortas. These are flat, low symmetrical domes. So now these are dacitic lavas that have relatively low viscosity. So what you're seeing there basically is like a balloon filling in the center, but it has such a low viscosity that it can't sometimes support its weight when it starts to build vertically. So it simply just sags under its own weight and spreads out laterally, okay? And then finally, a coulee is the same thing as a low dome, except now it's setting on a slope. So in addition to just flattening out, it's also flowing due to the influence of gravity down the slope, okay? Okay, any questions about that? Okay, let me kind of show you some examples of these here. Okay, so here's a uh, dacitic cryptodome. Okay, notice it's just a plug. It's like a piston that gets shot up due to uh, the pressure of the extrusion. Okay, so again, these are very high viscosity, relatively low volatile contents. Um, and again, like I mentioned, it's, it's pushed up as a solid, just like a piston. Um, and again, no significant deformation during this extrusion. Okay, so it's just coming directly out of the vent without any severe deformation. Okay, low domes are sort of on the opposite end of that. That's basically uh, very high viscosity. These are relatively low viscosity. When I say relatively low, it's still a dacitic lava. Okay, um, so again, low viscosity, very low yield strength. And again, as it pushes up, it's like inflating a balloon. But it has such a has a low enough viscosity that it can't build vertically simply because it sags under the influence of its own weight. So it builds up from the center just like inflating a balloon and it expands outward like this or sags outward like this. So it looks like a, kind of like an onion basically kind of put a cross section in there, okay? Okay, these are coolies. So coolies are a type of low dome, okay? But it's the low dome that's basically formed on a slope. So the vent now is coming out, the lava is coming out, the acidic lava is coming out. Okay, it's sagging under its own weight. It doesn't build vertically, but in this case it's on the slope, so it's going to start to sag downhill, if you will. So the gravity then basically allows it to flow downhill. Okay, well in this case, obviously the shear stress, the shear stress is being created by that flow of gravity downhill. It exceeds the yield strength. So if the yield strength and the shear stress were the same value, what would happen? If the yield stress in the magma was the same as the shear stress being created by the gravitational pull, what would happen? That's right, nothing would happen, it would stay still. So in this case, the pull of gravity is creating a force in the magma that exceeds, excuse me, the yield stress in the magma, so it tends to just ooze down and flow, okay? All right, now, Sometimes these will form, this is a, a satellite image, so you can imagine this one, this one is quite large, okay? Um, and again, you can't see it from this photograph, but many of them form ramp structures because it represents basically as we continue to intrude more magma into the center of that thing and it continues to 
basically grow and expand outward, it will overflow previous uh, sections of the of the coulee, if you will. So we end up with these ramp-looking structures as we go up slope. Now, in addition to that, here's pressure ridges, just like we saw in the Hoi Hoi. Okay, but in this case, these pressure ridges are huge. These are called ogives. Okay, in case some of them can be as much as 100 meters high, and they can be spaced out for several hundred meters. So mm -hmm. you can kind of see that at the scale that those that's five kilometers there. So wow. lots of space. Very, I mean, these are very large structures. Is what I'm trying to. Uh, what does that mean by the two lobes? I'm sorry. The there's two lobes here. There's a lobe here. Can you see that one? <clears throat> and then there's a lobe here. Oh. Yeah. So that represents two different eruptive events. Two different dome buildings, I should say. Okay. What are, are the point numbers? Like, is, is there, are there actually three lobes? Or is it like one, two? No, this was this was taken out of a uh, technical report from uh -huh. the USGS, and I think they were they were using those to refer to something else. Okay, they were just using the picture. Okay. Okay. Any questions about coolies? No. It's interesting. Where else have you heard the term coolie? Never. Um, everybody heard of the Grand Coulee Dam? No? <laughs> I know, right? The Grand Dam was a major, major uh, Corps of Engineers project in the 1940s. Um, it rivals the, everybody's heard of the Hoover Dam, right? Yes. <laughs> it rivals the Hoover Dam as far as its complexity and grand -ass, grandiosis, I guess, what do you want to call it? It's in, it's in southern Washington. Okay. It's on the... Uh, well, it's on the Grand Coulee, which is Coulee up there is a term that just simply means this large uh, channel that was basically carved out by a rapid flow of water. So in Washington, it's actually, I think, if I remember the origin of the word, I don't remember. It actually may be spelled slightly differently up there. Uh, but in this case, Coulee is an eruptive event forming this sort of sagging dome downhill. Whereas up there, the same word coulee is used to describe these erosional channels. Okay, and then they built a dam across one of these because they had a river at the bottom of it, and that's was the Grand Coulee Dam. Very famous. I'm surprised you haven't ever heard of it. Where did ogives come from? Ogive is, is a term. Ogive means basically these curved surfaces like that. Okay. Where I've heard the term more often is in the, it's a military term. It describes the curvature of a bullet or a projectile. So that curvature that comes up to a point, that shape is called an ogive. And there's different classes of that, so different radiuses of curvature, you can get different flight characteristics. And so, so there's a whole series of what's called ogives. Of different designs. So, but in this case, it's just talking about these things. These pressure ridges on these coolies are sometimes referred to as ogives. Okay. All right, any other questions? <laughs> okay, Pelion domes again, as I mentioned, these are the ones that are the most dangerous. Simply because these are generally formed from magmas that have an extremely high volatile content. Okay, however, uh, again, these don't typically explode, so what you end up doing is you get this very steep sided dome that starts to form. Okay. And then over time, the, the, well, let me back up. The problem with them is the volatiles inside are trapped in this magma, which has a relatively high viscosity, and they can't escape. But because those volatiles originate from very deep within the earth as this thing is erupting, those gas bubbles inside this thing, trapped inside this magma, is under extremely high pressure. Okay. So what happens is that magma, as it continues to move up, and it it's got enough viscosity now that it can grow upward doesn't spread out and flow like a low dome. Okay, so it continues to build upward. At some point, it reaches reaches the point of no return, if you will, and mechanically it can't support its weight anymore. It gets too high. It becomes unstable. And when that happens, it fractures, actually collapses and fractures through a whole series of uh, fracturing events. And literally, that high-pressure gas then escapes very rapidly. So you, it's, in essence, it's an explosion. Okay, but it's not like a volcanic eruption explosion. It's an explosion created by the collapse of the dome and the rapid release of that very high pressure gas. 
because it, it doesn't it doesn't an explosion in a typical rhyolitic let's say uh, eruption occurs because when you get the magma close to the surface again the gas bubbles rapidly expand when it comes to the surface um, but they do it right at the vent okay so in other words there we'll talk about that in the physics of eruptions okay but it, basically they're exploding as it's erupting Okay, this one doesn't explode until the, the dome grows big enough where it becomes unstable. Okay, then it collapses in the process of collapsing it explosively releases all this high pressure gas. Now, you can imagine that's just, it creates something that looks just like a pyroclastic density current from a collapsing column, except it's originating from the dome. And this is called a pyroclastic surge, a very rapid surge of material. And this material is coming down the mountain, it's hot, Okay, lots of high pressure gas is coming down and it's basically draining all the fractured pieces from the dome, which can vary from very small dust, ash size particles, all the way to particles the size of cars. Okay, so it's incredibly dangerous. Okay, and again, like I said, this was the event, that's why the, the, the term Helion is named after that, came from uh, the eruption of Saint, in Martinique, okay, destroyed the, the city of Saint Pierre. So again, sometimes these are called newly ordented in pyroclastic surface. That's a French term that was coined after the eruption of Martin. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, here's showing you one in uh, Indonesia. So you can see where you not want to be standing. <laughs> you don't want to be standing down slope of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in fact, this is the this this is the type of event. Um, that killed the two photographers, husband and wife team. This was in Mount Usen in Japan. Okay, okay volcanic necks and dikes, everybody should recognize at least the top picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You should recognize this. What was the name of the movie? Uh, Close Encounters of the Perfect Time. Have you ever seen it? <laughs> Aliens. You have never seen it? Oh, you've seen it. Never seen that. You should go read it. Okay. Is this on the Lewis and Clark Trail? No, no, it's too far north for that. It's, it, this was in, uh, this is out, this is in Wyoming, North Carolina. Are you sure that's too north? I think they went through Montana. Uh, well, maybe. I'm not sure about that. Because, you know, they came up the river, okay, and this is in the far northwest corner of Wyoming. I read a book so I doubt that they may have not seen it. I remember they climbed a structure like that, but I don't know if that was Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, there's like a little... Okay. Well, in any event, if you didn't, haven't seen the movie, go read it. It's called <laughs> uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It stars Richard Dreyfuss. Mm -hmm. Richard Dreyfuss is this crazy... I guess he's a... An electrician guy who works for the power company, so doing around driving a truck, fixing the telephone poles and light poles and stuff. But in any event, he some, somehow there's some type of a visitation by aliens. <laughs> aliens. And somehow this gets implanted in his mind. And one of the scenes, and he's trying to figure out where to go find the aliens. <laughs> uh, and I don't remember exactly how the story runs, but anyway, um, he gets obsessed with this, trying to figure out where to go find the aliens. And there's a scene where he's in his kitchen with his children, and they're eating dinner, and he has these mashed potatoes on his plate. And for some reason, with his mashed potatoes, he starts building Bill's Tower. Okay, so then he knows where to go look for them. And then at the end of the movie, they go there. And of course, the government goes there, and they have all the military people around it. And the alien spaceship comes and lands on him and takes him away. There he goes. That, it was like a real alien. No, no, I mean, as far as the movie is concerned, the alien ship did come. Oh. Now, how he got this in his mind, that they were going to come to the Devil's Tower, I'm not really sure. Okay. It, it, it was just the aliens, man. Yeah. Okay, but in the end, what does this represent? What do these volcanic necks represent? Can you tell me that? Mm. Well, okay, so this is basically the vent that's coming up through the center of the volcanic edifice. So you can imagine before erosion, okay, there was a volcano sitting on top of that, or, or I should say around it. 
Okay, so the volcanic neck is the magma that's now solidified and crystallized in that vent, that column that formed the vent to the surface. Now, over time, of course, the material that formed the volcanic edifice, the actual cone, of course, most of that stuff is relatively loose and unconsolidated because it's stuff that just kind of falls down to form the edifice. Um, over time, that erodes away. So this solid material that's crystallizing from the magma here is much more weathering resistant than the loose material that was there forming the cone. So as the cone slowly erodes away, it exposes this crystallized vent, if you will, material in the vent. Okay. So this is an example of that. What do we call this structure here? Can you see that? Yeah, the yeah, that's the columnar jointing. Okay, so it's telling you the material that formed Devil's Tower was relatively fine grained. Okay, so that also the columnar jointing forms in fine grained material. Okay, here's another one. Have you seen this? You've seen this picture in a lot of textbooks. This is in Ship Rock over in the north uh, northwest corner of uh, New Mexico. It's actually on the Navajo Reservation, so you can't actually go there without permission. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I think the the highway is close enough we can drive up. Okay, well, what's interesting about this one is you have these dikes, these radial dikes that extend out from that. Okay, you can see there's one there, there's one here, and then there's one in the background here. Uh, so it's shown you also that occasionally you'll get preserved the actual column, the eruptive column, and you'll also get dikes that form simply because when the magma chamber comes up, it's elevating the earth, and it puts the earth in tension, so you get these radial cracks that form okay, as you push the earth up. And sometimes those will get filled with magma that then crystallizes and remains after the edifice has eroded away. Okay. All right, now here's one closer to home. This is Spanish Peaks. Anybody look in there? Near Walsenburg, Colorado? That's just across the border from New Mexico. You go in here. Okay, um, and there's two of them here. There's an East Spanish Peak and then there's a West Spanish Peak. There's a great picture of the West Spanish Peak. And what you can't see, you can drive almost up to the back in here. There's a campground up in there that you can drive and spend the night. And then there's a trail that you can walk all the way to the top of this thing. It's, mm. it's a, almost, it's a little under 14,000 feet. It's not mm. quite 14,000 feet. Okay, but what's, what's really neat about it is all of these radial dikes that extend it out from these two peaks. And there's a, actually a highway that comes this way from Walsenburg up to here. And this is some pictures that I took along that highway. So you can see here's the dikes that were preserved after the country rock material eroded away. Hmm. You can kind of see the dike here standing down from the peak. You know, here right there's the dike. Huh. Really neat. And there's a town there, just south of it, called Rockwall. <laughs> For obvious reasons, because right in the town there's one of these dikes. 